Stevie, thank you very much. Uh, not many laughs in this talk. I'm going to try and pose the question of remembrance or commemoration and then answer it by saying why I think, as a member of this appeal, that we are putting this statue up in the park, the statue of a horse and a soldier in the, in the park in the middle of Romsey. Now, this picture is straightforward. Any village in the country and a memorial there to the soldiers who were killed in 1914, 1918 from that village. That is sheer remembrance, and there are many, many of them dotted around the country. This, of course, is commemoration. You all know this. This is the, the, uh, uh, the Triumphal Arch or the Wellington Arch at Hyde Park Corner, put up to commemorate the Napoleonic Wars. Not quite as lavish as it was meant to be, because George IV was at that time refurbishing Buckingham Palace. And originally, on top of the arch, was an enormous equestrian statue weighing 40 tons of Wellington on a horse. It's the largest equestrian statue ever been made in this country. And nobody liked it. They didn't do anything about it until he died. And then it was moved to Aldershot, the statue, and indeed the whole of the arch was moved to its current position. And on top was put the Angel of Peace over the chariot of war. That is commemoration. And bang next door to it, those of you who have seen the wonderful new Bomber Command Memorial to the 55,573 airmen and air crew who were killed in the Second World War. And it is this beautiful bronze statue of the Bomber crew. That is pure remembrance. But there is a mixture in between. And I just show you this particular one. It is in Indiana in America. It is a World War I memorial. It was put there because they were hoping to attract the American Legion, the equivalent of the British Legion, to have their headquarters in Indiana. Hugely powerful, the American Legion. Not so with the British Legion in this country. But in it is not only remembrance, but it's commemoration as well, but it's a functional building. So all these things are in one building. And then, just out of sheer interest, this is the First World War memorial that was built just outside the, the port at Basra. It commemorates 40,500 Empire soldiers killed in World War I, including my great-grandfather, my great-uncle, one of my great-uncles. It was moved from the port area because that region was needed for extra housing in 1997 by Saddam Hussein, and it was moved extremely carefully to the current position you see that there. Now, amongst in this country, at the end of the First World War, there are no less than 54,000 memorials put up. Why? Was it pride? Was it atonement? Was it hope? Was it gratitude? Was it anger? Or was it guilt? Was it any of all of those things? Or was it perhaps simply because there were no graves of our soldiers in this country, because none of them were brought back, none were allowed to be brought back during the First World War? And of course, every year since the end of the First World War, there's been a two-minute silence. But none of that happened a hundred years ago today. The army were the scum of the earth. And when they died on the battlefield, they were buried in mass graves. There are virtually only a handful of any form of statues to us in the, on the continent. There is 15 officers remembered at the Waterloo Monument in Brussels, for instance. And of course, one of the reasons, it's humiliation. In the Crimea, where we lost a large number of people, there were originally 139 cemeteries, which very soon went down to 11. 20 years after the Crimea, there was only one. The Boer War is interesting as well. The Boer War is remembered in this country for the fact that 450,000 horses died there, and there were more memorials in this country to horses that were killed than soldiers. And most of them are on troughs. And here you see one remembering them. And on another one, I came across with the inscription, killed in a cause of which they knew nothing. And then in South Africa itself at Port Elizabeth, this very moving statue of a soldier tending a horse. And underneath the inscription, the greatness of a nation consists not so much in the number of its people or the extent of its territory, as in the extent and justice of its compassion. And just taking this theme further, a little bit further forward to 2004, 
when, as you all know, at Hyde Park, this wonderful memorial put up to animals that were killed and to be commemorated in warfare. This is remembrance, not of particular animals, but it's also of commemoration. And as they go through that gap, a horse and a dog alive, presumably gambling above us, but not with us any longer. But of the inscription on the outside, it has got the inscription, they had no choice. Now, that is very political, and it is a critical comment, and much, actually, criticism of it was raised at the time. The Australians got over this problem in 2009 when they brought back from Egypt, a port said, part of the destroyed uh, memorial to the Desert Mounted Corps, and now it sits outside Canberra. And on it, the inscription, served alongside Australian armed forces, much gentler, much gentler than our critical comment in Hyde Park. And of course, it leads on to what we're talking about later in this, in this talk, of what we hope to put up, or what we are going to put up, in the Memorial Park in Romsey, at this wonderful maquette, which of course has been made, um, as you know, by our sculptor sitting here with us now. But as I say, all that in 1918 was about to change. Britain had lost, or the empire had lost, 1,100,000 people killed. 800,000 of them were British. I just put up that chart, so you can see on our side, the Allied side, that all the, the major losses, five million in all, British, French, and Russian. Of course, on the German side as well, another five million killed. And ours were killed on the Western Front, Palestine, Mesopotamia, East Africa, Greece, and Italy. And if the ghosts of those men, four abreast, started to march past the Cenotaph, the end of the column would be in Durham. That really does make you think. But as I say, all this was about to change because of one man, a man called Fabian Ware. He was really an educationist. He'd worked with Lord Milner in South Africa on education in the early, uh, the early parts of 1900. And then in 1906, he came back to edit the Morning Post, a very right-wing newspaper. And the war broke out. He was 38 years old and too old initially to actually be accepted into the army. And so he volunteered to command the British, a British Red Cross flying unit. And when he went out there, working between the French and the British behind the lines, he noticed that wounded and killed people were not being registered in a proper way. And so he set up a wounded and missing persons department. Five months later, they recorded 16,200 killed 47,700 wounded and 16,700 missing. And Ware then asks that the Red Cross give some form of durable inscription to the, to the crosses which are all over the battlefield. And you can see why, the sort of conditions that these graves were actually in at the time. In May 1915, they had registered another 4,300 graves. And then, Another coincidence, the Adjutant General of the British Forces out in France, General McCready, hears of his good work and appoints Fabian Ware to run his work within the army and up, is set up the Directorate of the Graves Registration Commission and Inquiry. By October 1915, 27,000 graves have been registered and 6,000 photographed. Now, why were they photographed? Well, the reason was that back at home, when they knew their sons had been killed or their husbands had been killed, they would like to have known where they were buried and, if possible, to see a photograph. But you can see the problems that Fabian Ware was having with all the graves and those sorts of landscapes. It was an extremely difficult thing to do. And the other reason that they wanted to know was they heard that the French were setting up mobile crematoria, and indeed they were. And they thought that their children or wives or rather husbands were being burnt would have been a terrible thing for them to think in England at the time. Then the 29th of December, 1915, a key moment. Fabian Ware persuaded the French to give us land in perpetuity for cemeteries. He did it through his personal charm. He did it through his fluency in, having, in the French language. And by this stage, in early 1916, another 50,000 graves have been registered. And sites for 20 cemeteries were then selected. 
and a decision was taken that nobody would be exhumed and taken back to this country. And of course, the other problem they had with crosses, how do you differentiate between Christians and the huge number of different religions that were fighting on the Allied side, including, of course, Chinese? And this became a problem later on. And two, the argument raised too, what about soldiers who are being shot for desertion? Where should they be buried? And initially it was thought that they should be just put aside, but there was a furore about that as well. And it was, they were allowed to be buried in the same cemeteries as our soldier. And I digress for a moment, because one of the things I do is I get very involved with the, um, with the National Memorial Arboretum up in Staffordshire. And there we have a shot at Dawn Grove, which you see there. And all those stakes in the ground are for the 306th people, soldiers, who were shot for cowardice or desertion. And of course, they were pardoned a few years ago. Some were murderers, and they do not have their stakes in the ground there. And you can see in the middle the white figure, and in front of him the six fir trees representing the firing squad. And then the white figure closer to is, of course, but not of course, is a private herd of a burden, aged 17, shot. The Reverend Julian Bickerseth, who kept a diary throughout the First World War, sat with one of these condemned men throughout the night, and he recorded what his feelings were. And when he turned, he turned to the soldier, who turned his blindfold face to me, and he said in a voice which wrung my heart, kiss me, sir, kiss me, before the firing squad sent him into the great unseen. Deeply moving stuff. The Somme, day one. 50,000 casualties in four and a half months, four, 415,000. And of course, the problem with the Somme, even though that some of the cemeteries that I saw here had become well organized, is the huge bombardments went on, that the land captured was recaptured, and not just bodies being destroyed, whole graves were being destroyed, and indeed whole landscapes. Whereas problems were intense. But they still managed to register another 100,000 graves. And then you came to the third battle of the Ypres in 1917. 70,000 killed. And of course, at Ypres and the Somme, the bodies were littering the battlefield. His problems were intense. But in May 1917, the Imperial War Graves Commission was set up to plan for the future. They thought that this war was going to be ended shortly, and they were wondering what to do. It was an incredibly impressive um, panel, led by the Prince of Wales. The chairman was the Secretary of State for War. The vice chairman, Fabian Ware. On the, on the committee, Kipling, Lord Milner, Lutyens, Herbert Baker, hugely important people of their time. And they turned to Lutyens and said to him, could you make the Stone of Remembrance? And this is this wonderful 10-ton Portland stone, Stone of Remembrance, that is in every cemetery that has over a 1,000 graves in it. And actually, Lutyens, being a very direct man, refused to make it any smaller for smaller cemeteries. It could only, therefore, go into the larger cemeteries. And Churchill said, who himself became the Secretary of State for War, this wonderful Churchillian comment, these great stones will exist even in 2,000 years and will preserve the memory of a common purpose pursued by a great nation in the remote past. Regiment Blomfield, another great architect, was asked to design the Cross of Sacrifice. And he did. And he allowed that Cross of Sacrifice to be made in different sizes to meet the requirements of the cemetery that it actually went into. But the arguments raised in the committee, how best to honor the dead, did we want to conform to a certain pattern what about private rights of the people whose sons or husbands are being killed? What about rank? What about religion? And so they appointed Sir Frederick Kenyon, who was director of the British Museum. And the only restriction they put on him was that there was no distinction between officers and men. And by this stage, four nurseries for producing flowers and all the things that needed to go into a cemetery had been built. 150,000 more graves have been registered and 70 cemeteries planted. And then in 1919, the final German offensive and counterattack. And you'll remember it moved a vast distance over the land that we occupied, and so more mayhem with the cemeteries that had already been planted. 
350,000 killed or wounded. On the 21st of March, in five hours, a German fired over a million shells. You can imagine what that did to the ground. It ravaged existing works of cemeteries. But then, of course, in 1919, after the ceasefire, the great work rarely began. Cemeteries were to be designed, 1,200 or more. And also, I read, a ribbon of half a million graves, like the Milky Way across miles of desolate country, cut about with trenches and pockmarked with craters, strewn with, with smashed plank roads and miles of rusting barbed wire, was what they had to compend contend with. And of course, they tried to disturb as few graves as humanly possible. But soldiers in groups of 12 and volunteers paid two and, two and six a day combed the battlefields for graves, for unmarked graves, for graves that needed to be moved. In the first 18 months, 180,000 graves were reinterred, or bodies were reinterred. In the second, 76,000. In the third, 38,000. In all, 294,000 bodies were reinterred to move into the cemeteries that were built like a Milky Way across Belgium and France. 58,000 headstones were going to be needed. What would they be? Why not crosses? What would they cost? Would they be dull? Would they be repetitive? And here you see a lovely picture of the king and you, with Fabian Ware with his hand on his chin and Haig just behind the king, looking at sort of suggestions when he went out there. And the king played a great part in what was going on. And the War Graves Commission once again turfed in Lutchins. And of course, you all know what he came up with. Two foot six inches high, one foot three inches across and three inches deep. They had the crest, the rank, the name, the date of death, the age, a simple Christian sentiment or a sentiment chosen by the relatives. And you've all seen these moving, moving things that are put on these headstones. A gentle knight. We will never forget you. And in one, Vivat Shabernia, for a Shabernian who loved his school, and his parents put that on the gravestone. Or just on another I came across, good night, daddy. Deeply moving stuff. And of course, you had the problem of 180,000 bodies not known, but bodies that were there. A, a soldier of the great war known unto God. But there was an outcry in this country. They were ugly. They were ungainly. They were soulless. And there was a huge debate in Parliament, which ran for days. And I just give you the sort of emotion that was running in Parliament at the time. An MP quoted a letter from one of his constituents. I lost my only boy in the war. I am blind and his mother is deaf. I was told that he was buried near the grave of Raymond Asquith. That was Asquith's son. And I wonder if you could tell me that the grave is well kept. Pathetic. But they didn't know in this country, they didn't know where their loved ones had been buried. The paper, a headline, not even in death shall we be allowed to choose for them. And the Bishop of Exeter's uh, wife, who'd lost three sons in the war, she wrote to the Times, in the name of thousands of heartbroken parents, wives, brothers, and sisters, allow us a cross, an alternative to the headstone. It is only through the hope of the cross that most of us are able to carry on the life where all the sunshine seems to have gone out. Pathetic stuff. By 1921, there were seven nurseries, 75 miles of fire beds, two hundreds of lakers of lawn, and 10 million cubic feet of good stone had been quarried. And of course, you get wonderful examples like Etard, where there are 11,000 graves. And the king, as I said, played a great part in all this. And, and he went in 1922 round to look at some of these places. And I just read you what he said when he was in one of these cemeteries. I have many times asked myself whether there can be more potent advocates of peace upon earth than this massed multitude of silent witnesses to the desolation of war. But then the problem became what do they do about all those who are missing? And of course, the Imperial War Graves Commission had taken over all the records from the Ministry of Defense. They were stacked four cabinets high, and it stretched for 150 yards. Kipling, have you heard the news of my son Jack, that famous poem where he lost his son admittedly at sea, but many other comments like that. 
and these great monuments were designed. And here you have 1927, Bloomfield's Menin Gate. On the Menin Gate, and many of you will have been there, uh, 58,986 names. And interestingly, only 78 minor spelling mistakes in that enormous amount of carving. And then, and here you see Fabian Ware and the Prince of Wales going to the unveiling of, Luch of Luchens' famous Thiepval Memorial. And here you have mo the memory of, or named there, uh, 70,085. And so, as that Menin Gate, which stands over the Somme area, dominating the whole area, the great task was complete. And what had been created was an empire of the silent dead. But I'd like to just go back to 1919 for a moment, because in July 1919, there was a peace procession in London, and Lutyens had created a wooden plaster cenotaph where the cenotaph is today. It became the people's shrine. The flowers all around it made it seem very permanent. And so the decision was taken to make it permanent. And at the same time, the Foreign Secretary, Lord Curzon, had an idea planted to him by the Reverend David Relton, who won the Military Cross and had served throughout the war. And he suggested that there should be the Tomb of the Unknown Warrior. Now, the story of the Tomb of the Unknown Warrior is well, well known. But I'm just going to repeat it again because it's so important, I think, to where we're going at, later on in this talk. On the 7th of November, uh, 1920, four burial parties left St. Paul, which is the headquarters of the army, the British army, left out in France. They went to Ypres, one, one to Arras, one to Somme, one to the Aisne, and they dug up one of the bodies there. They were totally ignorant of why they were doing this. They put them in sacks, and they brought them back to a makeshift chapel at St. Paul. Late that evening, Brigadier Wyatt, who was in charge, and Colonel Gill, some say blindfolded, went into the chapel and put the hand on the sack that was to be chosen. The others were returned later on to the, to the cemeteries that they had come from. And the sack was put into an English deal coffin. On the 8th of November, there was a noon service. And then it was put on a battered ambulance and covered with the flag which had belonged to Railton, the Union Jack, spattered in blood, and taken to another temporary chapel and guarded by the French 8th Infantry Battalion. On the 10th of November, two undertakers arrived from England, and they removed the body, and they put it into a heavy coffin made of Hampton Court oak, and they banded it with iron. And on top they put the inscription, a British warrior who fell in the Great War for king and country. And then at 10.30, the bells at Boulogne rang out. The coffin was draped in a, ta a tattered flag, the same tattered flag, and carried on a, car uh, on, a, on a cart, carried by six black horses, escorted by the sixth chasseur of Lille. They went to the Quai Cambretta, there accompanied by Marshal Foch, and put onto HMS Verdun, and escorted out into the channel, and then escorted across the channel by six British warships. They arrived at Dover to a 19-gun salute, a salute selected for field marshals, and the guard at the quayside was produced by the Connaught Rangers. Onto a train, it was driven to Victoria Station, and it was said that people came out on the stations the whole way to Victoria in silence to watch it go by. And on 9.20, on the 11th of November, the Coldstream Guard Barrack Party formed up. They put it onto the carriage to be carried through to uh, Westminster Abbey, dragged by six black horses. They went up Constitution Hill, up the Mall, through Admiralty Arch, a stately, very stately funeral, full of symbolism, full of private emotion. And then they arrived at the Cenotaph, and there was the king who laid on top of the coffin a wreath, and on the wreath it said, in proud memory of those who died unknown in the Great War, unknown and yet well known, as dying, behold, they live. And then the cenotaph was unveiled. These huge flags fell down, and the first of the two minutes silence. When that was over, they took the coffin to the abbey. There was there a guard of honor of 100 members who had won the Victoria Cross. Everything about this was symbolism, and as the coffin was laid into the tomb, so the king threw soil down that had come from France and laid his crusader sword on top of the coffin. 
And the, on top of the coffin was laid this wonderful inscription. Under this stone rests the body of a British warrior, unknown by name or rank, brought from France to lie amongst the most illustrious of this land. That day, 200,000 people filed past, not only the tomb, but also the cenotaph. One and a half million people went past the cenotaph during the course of that week, and it became absolutely covered in flowers. I put up this next picture. It is very lovely, but it's also slightly sad because a year later, the Dean of Westminster decided to change the inscription that was on the tomb. Although he kept the original bit, he added, of course, a number of verses, texts from the New Testament, which completely destroyed, really, the original purpose of what was said in the first place. Who knows what religion that person actually came from. So in World War I and then later in World War II, there are 23,000 burial cemeteries looked after by the Imperial War Graves Commission, now the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. Now I want to move forward in time to Arlington. A friend of mine, David Giles, went to Arlington in the 1990s and was inspired and said, why are we not doing anything in this country for remembrance in a similar way? And he came back, he was working for Leonard Cheshire at the time, just before he died. Let us establish, they said, a memorial arboretum in the middle of the country. And they found in Staffordshire 150 acres of a reclaimed quarry, given then to them by Lafarge for this purpose, costing one pound a year for 999 years. 60,000 trees were planted, 32 of the 33 native trees of the country. And it was opened in 2001. And now it looks very bad, but I promise you in 20 years' time, it will look wonderful. It is full of symbolism. Here I give you a picture of an oak wood. There are in that wood 2,535 oaks, one for each merchant ship that was sunk in the Second World War. And 32,000 merchant seamen lost their lives. Every tree that isn't going to be cut and pruned for thinning has been given in for some particular reason. This one is deeply moving in memory of Jane Harrison, who won the George Cross, the only fourth lady ever to win the George Cross. She lost her life when she was 22 years old. A BOAC aeroplane caught fire at London Airport, and one of the chutes to get people out failed to work, and so everybody went down one chute, and she was pushing them all down. Everybody was out except for one, one person who was disabled at the back of the aeroplane, and she went to help her out, but the plane caught fire, and they both died. Deeply moving. I was telling that story on a cruise where I was lecturing about two years ago, and a lady came up to me after, and she said, you know, I shared a flat with Jane Harrison when that happened, and it's the sort of thing you can do except for just hug each other and both burst into tears, which I unashamedly did. The Basra Wall is there, commemorating the same wall that was in Basra, commemorating the 176 servicemen and one Ministry of Defense civilian who were killed during the Iraq conflicts, the second Iraq conflicts. And then you have, for instance, something completely different, commemorating the railway men who gave their lives for this country. And then wonderful other statues too. This is the lovely statue to the parachute regiment. And in the middle of it all is the Armed Forces Memorial. It's on a tumuli. It's made with 200,000 bricks for Portland Stone. And on the walls inside are carved the names of 16,000 soldiers, sailor, and airmen, and merchant seamen who have died since the end of the Second World War. That's a large number. And then these two beautiful stone, uh, bronzes, you can only see one here, named the Pity of War. A dead soldier being carried on a stretcher, as warriors would have been in years gone past, carried by a soldier, a sailor, an airman, and a marine. And you can see the mother and the child at one end and the grieving parents at the other. But this really, therefore, is all about remembrance, but it's all about commemoration as well. It's a mixture of both. It's a wonderful 150 acres to go to if you ever happen to be passing a place called Arawas in Staffordshire. And so I come now to what we're really talking about this evening for the last few moments, and the Romsey War Horse Memorial. In 1914, the army had 19,000 horses and mules. They knew 
if, uh, in 1914, that if there was to be a war, they would have to have many, many more horses. And a plan had been laid. I can tell you that the plans that were laid for the First World War are incredibly detailed. There was nothing that happened in the First World War that wasn't meticulously planned. So criticism of the generals and what was going on from that point of view is actually not at all fair. In the first 12 days of the war, 140,000 horses already pinpointed were collected up. But they had to go to what was called remount centers. Just some statistics about during the war, nearly half a million were sent to France and Belgium from this country. Quite a lot came from America. At one stage, over 1,000 horses a day were received from America. And our losses in France and Belgium of horses ran at about 15% a year. Only 62,000 of the half million that we sent there returned to the United Kingdom. After the war, they weren't all killed. Some were used for the occupation and what was going to happen. Some were used for reconstruction work, and others were simply eaten by starving people. 30 million tons of oats, 25 million tons of pressed hay, staggering figures to feed all these horses during this period. But new remount centers were clearly needed to cope. And of course, Romsey, 150 acres, as you well know, Ramville's farm, Bill Hughes's home, was built by March 1915. Ten squadrons, 500 horses each, manned by 200 soldiers, looked after anything up to 5,000 horses at one time. It took about four months to get them there from America and get them ready for training. And once they were trained, then they were sent out whenever needed in whatever batches through Southampton. The famous two living there that we've heard about, Colonel Herbal Jessel, who looked after, the, looked after the remount depot for the, right, the war, and Lionel Edwards, the great artist. He was there as an officer throughout the war as well. Just a few pictures to remind you of what Ramville's farm would have looked like at that stage, and a lovely picture by Lionel Edwards. And Rob, Romsey had a population at that time of about 6,000 people. So you can see that 2,000 up the road at the, at the remount depot would have made a considerable difference. Exercising was essential. 